morning. Good morning. Go ahead and uh, as you make your way to your seat, make sure you have two things. You need your bulletin and then you need your communion cup. Now, uh, there are there are a few cups here at the front. If you didn't pick one up, most of them are there in the back. Um, does anybody need a communion cup? Raise your hand if you did not pick up. Can I have some of my elders uh, look for the hands that have not gotten a communion cup? They're, they're in the back. Um, go ahead and grab one. We have a few announcements, so feel free to get up and get what you need. But it's a communion cup with a wafer all together. Uh, so as you get that and get your bulletins, let me give you a few announcements real quick. It is good to see you all. I still have horrible memories of preaching to an empty sanctuary. Whenever I see this room loud with talking and seeing you here, it just fills my heart in ways that it never has before. So I'm happy to see you all. And if you're tuning in online, we want to welcome you this morning to our Sunday worship. Uh, in, in your bulletin, there are three announcements that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, the session meeting is not going to be tomorrow, the 17th. I've moved it to the 18th, Tuesday. Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Elders, let me know if that does not work, but that's when we're going to have our session meeting uh, this coming week. Church, this provides a great opportunity for you to pray for your elders. Their names are in the bulletin, but we need your prayer. We need your encouragement. Uh, as we make decisions, as the committee does work, and bring it to the elders. We need prayer, wisdom, unity to continue to move the church forward. I uh, also want to make a quick announcement. Uh, the last Sunday of this month, the 30th, is Senior Sunday. And to my knowledge, you please correct me after church if I'm wrong, we have only one senior this year, uh, Miss Gracie back there, and she is so happy to get ready to graduate. So on the 30th, we will have a uh, special day recognizing and praying for her uh, very specifically. Lastly, I want to bring up uh, church camp. We are going to be able to do church camp this year. It's going to be June 13th through the uh, 18th. It's at uh, Millport at Lake Timberlake. It's, we, we, we went two years ago. It was a phenomenal camp. Um, and I believe we're going to have about eight to ten from our church going. The total camp number is about at 100. And adults, if any of you would like to go and to participate at church camp, we would love uh, you to be there with us. We need your help. Um, so I know some of you may be a little bit freer come this summer. And if you want to join, please do. Um, last two quick announcements. Make sure as you've come in, you have a communion cup. Uh, we will have communion at the end of the service. They're back there. So if you need one, get it. And number two, because we're doing something new, during my pastoral prayer, I'm starting to mention church member names that are not sick that I just want to highlight and to pray specifically for. So if I pray, so for this Sunday, we're going to be praying for Mike and Gwen Burks. Nothing is wrong with them that I know of, but I just want to pray a special prayer. We as a church together for the Burks, and we're just going to go down the alphabet. Okay. With all of those things said, grab your bulletin and let's get ready to worship the Lord. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Let us celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of miracle and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Today we're going to sing a hymn, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And we're going to be thinking about Jesus Christ this morning as we take communion. So this is a great song to get us thinking about the mystery and the person of Jesus Christ. Would you stand and with the insert in your bulletin, sing with me? Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises 
robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of Man. In His living, in His suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in Him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption, see the Father's plan unfold. Bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain him, praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected, as we will be when he comes. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a great mystery. Jesus, the eternal Son, begotten of the Father, slain by death, who is the God of life. How hard that is to comprehend. But we know that no grave could ever restrain your Son, Jesus Christ, and your power rose Him from the dead, from the grave, to be victorious forevermore, the eternal King, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, who reigns in majesty and rules over all things. That is our God. That is our Savior. And Father, this morning we come into this building, joined hands as a church, to sing praises to You, to Your Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that our worship would be appropriate and acceptable to you, aided by the Holy Spirit, brought to you through the mediation of Jesus Christ to your throne. Warm our hearts and lift us to heaven as we listen and pray and hear the gospel and the sermon as we sing and as we affirm our faith and take of the Lord's Supper, Lord, we, we ask that you would use the Holy Spirit to woo us in our affections, to love you more and to be more devoted to you and to be greater at saying no to sin. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Our reading this morning it comes from Isaiah 40, and actually uh, 1 through 8. And I preface this with saying, it is the comfort of God's people. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight 
in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of our God stands forever. A voice says, cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Will our children come forward, please? Good morning. Guess what, Weston? Are you Weston? We have a lady here. I heard you said it was all boys today. My name is Miss Debbie. Do y'all remember that? Tell me your names one more time. What's your name? Kennedy. Kinsey. Jeremiah. Weston. Judah. This is my assistant. His name is Mr. Jonathan. Oh, okay. All right. Well, y'all, on my phone, I have an app for the Bible. And in this app, there's a man that reads the scripture. And I love listening to him read. So I want, I'm going to let him read these 10 verses to y'all. First, let's talk about what was your lesson last week in here. It was about a covenant. Do y'all remember what a covenant is? Anybody? It's kind of like a, a deal. Remember? Like, you've got a deal. A deal or a pact, right? Well, today... Y'all know how Mr. McBride reads the verses up here to y'all in the mornings? And he says in his Bible, at the top, there is like a little heading. Well, today's heading in this section is called the fall. So we're going to have a fall from that covenant, okay? From that promise or that deal. We're going to have a fall from that. And I want y'all to listen to it from my Bible app, Jonathan. I want you to, if you'll hold that, you'll push play and stop at verse 11. Okay. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. 
and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? So y'all, what has happened here now, what has happened here now is that they were tempted, right? They were tempted to break that covenant, and they did. I use this sock puppet when I teach kindergarten in the summer. I like props. Well, I need her for kindergarten. The kindergartners like her too. I thought she looked a little bit like a serpent. And that serpent, the Bible said he was very subtle and conniving, right? He was tricky. And so he tricked Adam and Eve by telling them, hey, if you eat that fruit that God told you not to, you'll be just like God. And you'll be so smart and so big and so strong. And he's just telling you that, but it's not true. Well, they were tempted and they did it, right? They ate the fruit and then they were embarrassed. Y'all know what embarrassed is? You ever been embarrassed? Ashamed of something that you did maybe? It happens. It happens to all of us because nobody's perfect, right? And so, I want to talk to y'all about the apple. In this basket here, I have a whole basket full of apples. And I think the apple sometimes gets a bad rap, you know? You're about to see them. Look, I have red ones. I've already washed these, too. I have red ones and green ones. I have gala apples. Those are my favorites. And red delicious apples. And so I want to tell y'all that it's okay to eat apples now. And some, some versions of the Bible even say it might not have been an apple, and not some versions of the Bible, but some interpretations say it might have been a fig, might have been a grape. It was just the fruit. And that's just a, an example to us, right, of being tempted to do something that we know not to do. But when we do it anyway, there are consequences, right? But don't think that you can't eat apples because apples are good for you. And I brought you all an apple to have, okay? If you want to, do you, do you want to come? Why don't you come after church and get your apple, okay? You can pick your own color and they're already cleaned and washed. And I'm going to sit right back here where I always sit with my basket. And y'all can come and get an apple. But just remember what I want you to take away from this lesson is that even when we sin and even when we fall into temptation, then God still loves us, right? And we pray for forgiveness and we try to do our best to keep our covenants, right? Right? Okay. Y'all come see me after church and you can have a bright, shiny, clean apple. You can look at them. You can. Thank you. My dad would often joke and say it wasn't the apple in the tree, it was the pear on the ground. Some of you will get that at lunch. Some of you are still thinking about it. All right, would y'all turn with me uh, in your hymnals to page 609, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. 609. Go ahead and stand. 609, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. 
leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. You may be seated and let us pray again to the Lord. Our Father in heaven. Again, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to gather with one another, to sing, listen, pray, to lift our voices high. And Father, this morning, we as your children, as your priests, we pray on behalf of those that we love and those that we know. We pray that you would continue to bring healing to Miss Sue and let her come home soon out of that hospital. Give her strength. Give those around her tender hands to care for her. We pray for Miss Francis that your um, ministering angels will attend to her needs and the caregivers that are around her. Lord, we pray for Mr. Wayne Stuttered that you would bring a calmness to the new news that he's received and that you would also bring healing to him through uh, surgery and through um the hands of the doctors and those nurses. We pray that you would continue to heal Miss Blanche Ewing, Miss Jean Mordecai, and we pray for answers and for healing for Christine, Father. Among those that we lift up today, we lift in a special way Mike and Gwen. We thank you for their long service to this church, for their love for you and for the people that make this church up. Lord, we pray that you would give them uh, strength to attend to the tasks that you've put before them. Miss Gwen taking care of her mother, Mike with the business and helping with other family duties, that you would make each task, though it is wearisome and, and, and is hard, make it a joy as well. Give them uh, happy moments in the midst of sometimes drudgery work and let them be a blessing to all those around them. We pray for Mike's business, that you would bless it. And let Miss Gwen enjoy some of that retirement time. Lord, the tithes and the offerings that have been given have been given out of a trust that uh, it is better to be generous than stingy. And so we give money to you because you gave it to us. Trusting with it, our good, our welfare, trusting that you will increase our faith and dependence upon you, but Lord, also trusting that you will use those funds to building up this church and your kingdom that not only exists here in this uh, county, but the state, the country, and the world. Help us to be ministers to the ones around us. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. If you would, go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn not... To Exodus. Do not turn to Exodus this morning. Turn to the Gospel of Mark. It's in the New Testament. You have Matthew and then you have Mark. Go ahead and turn there. That's where our summer series is going to be. And I am very excited. Uh, 
We have not been in a gospel book since John, the gospel of John that we did uh, over, I think, about four, three or four summers. So we are here now in Mark. Now, as you turn there, we're going to have a quick Bible trivia game. Um, and you don't have to yell out because that could become very disruptive, but you can kind of shrug or nod your head or something. Can you name the only state, like the United States, the only state of the union that's mentioned in the Bible? It's the great state of Arkansas. Noah looked out the ark and saw. Yep, yep, it's there. Did you know that the wise men had a side gig? They were all firemen because they came from afar. And that there are three baseball games that take place in the Bible. You have uh, in John's gospel, John begins his gospel in the beginning. Took some of you a, a few a little bit longer. John tells us that God is the eternal, that, that God the Son, Jesus Christ, is the Word, and that the Word has been with God for all of eternity. Moses begins the book of Genesis with a baseball game in the beginning, telling us that God created all things. He took from disorder and made it order. He created Himself a temple to be worshipped in. And lastly... The Gospel of Mark that we are starting today also has a baseball game in the beginning, which takes place at the very start of Jesus' ministry on earth. The beginning of the Gospel. Now let's understand a few things about Mark's Gospel that contrasts Matthew's, Luke's, and John. Because if you don't know, you don't really know why do we have four stories of the same thing? Well, yes, they are in different perspectives. And some of the details change based upon their perspectives, though the overall thrust of all four books attest to the same thing. Matthew is a Jew. He's a Jewish tax collector named Levi, and he is writing his book specifically with the Jewish people in mind. Jewish people who knew the Old Testament very well. That's what they grew up on. That was their bread and butter. That's why you find in Matthew many, many references to Old Testament scriptures and prophecies. That's why Matthew begins his gospel with a genealogy that traces Jesus all the way back to Father Abraham. Now Luke is a Gentile. He's a Greek. He's not writing to the Jews per se. Luke is writing to a Gentile rich benefactor named Theophilus that we learn in chapter 1. Theophilus has sent Luke, a scholar and a historian, to go write about the tales of Jesus. So much like Sherlock Holmes, Luke goes and investigates. And he writes his book with a Greek mind, Greek audience in mind, of how Jesus was the perfect man. He was the God-man. Now, John breaks the mold. John is not writing uh, from an earthly perspective. Matthew, the king of the Jews. Mark, the servant who has become king. Luke, the, the, the God-man. John is writing from a heavenly perspective. Here is... God the Son who has eternally existed, who has taken on flesh and has dwelt among us. All four Gospels have a different audience and thrust in mind. But Mark also stands in contrast to the others because if you read Mark, it has a fast-paced beginning with Jesus' baptism. We don't get a birth narrative. All about the angel Gabriel, the shepherds, Mary, the birth of John, none of it. It just begins with the baptism of Jesus Christ, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And 42 times, Mark uses the word immediately. In fact, I want you to read through Mark several times during our series this summer. Underline every time you see the word immediately. 
Mark shows Jesus constantly on the move. He gives us a picture of an active, energetic, swift, moving, uh, warring, conquering king. So with that kind of a background as we go into Mark, let us read our passage this morning. Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locust and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came down from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Father, we have heard the reading of your holy and inerrant and perfect word. We pray that you would write the truths upon our hearts. Help us to be able to hear, see, and understand these words. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's just jump into this passage. Point one, I just want you to see immediately the gospel in a sentence. Point one, the gospel in a sentence. This is good news. Mark begins immediately with we have some good news for the Roman world. That's who Mark is writing to. Probably, we're most likely, to Jews in Rome. So look at verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let's kind of take those words apart real quick and kind of unearth what we can find. The beginning. Here is God's anointed king who has been promised to Eve all the way back in the garden. You remember after she sins, her and Adam sin. God says, I'm going to put enmity between you, talking to the serpent, and the woman. Between your offspring and her offspring. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That is the very first gospel promise. All the way from there, now God is fulfilling that promise in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Every foreshadow of New Testament uh, pictures, motifs of Jesus, Jesus the greater Moses, Jesus the greater temple, Jesus the Lamb of God, all of these Old Testament archetypes are taking form in the person of Jesus Christ, as he now reveals himself. The gospel, or the beginning of the gospel. Let's talk about the word gospel. Mark, writing to Roman Christians who are dealing with persecution under Emperor Nero. You think we have it bad today? Go read about what Christians experienced under the rule of Nero. And I'm not just saying this to be dramatic. I'm not going to tell you because we have kids in the room. But that's what the Christians experienced during Nero. That's who Mark is writing to. Christians who are risking everything by following Jesus Christ. And now they hear this letter beginning with the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ huddled together in caves and catacombs, in groves, trying not to be spotted by the enemy. And these words, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would have hit them differently 
than it does us. You hear Christopher Walken say, I need more cowbell, and you have reference to that. And it makes you laugh. These Christians hearing the beginning of the gospel, that would have hit them in a different way. One historical commentary says this, the term gospel, it's the Greek word evangel, that's why there was a church here that used to be named evangel church, it meant gospel church. Evangel, evangelize, that means gospel, good news. It was not a word first coined among Christians. That was new. On contrary, the concept was significant both in the pagan and in Jewish cultures. Among the Romans, it meant joyful tidings and was associated with the cult of the emperor, whose birthday, attainment to majority, and accession to power were celebrated at festival occasions for the whole world. The report of such festivals were called evangels. Gospels. In the inscriptions of the papyri that we still have, a calendar inscription from about uh, 9 BC found in Asia Minor says of the Emperor Octavian, we know him as Emperor Augustus, Caesar Augustus, the birth of the God was for the world, the beginning of joyful tidings, aka the gospel, which have been proclaimed on his account. This inscription is remarkably similar to Mark's initial line. And it clarifies the essential content of the evangel in the ancient world. An historical event which introduces a new situation for the world. That's the idea. The emperor has been born. He is a going to power. This is a new era. This is a new beginning. Joyful tidings. And now Mark robs that wordage, and puts it to Jesus. In the beginning, joyful tidings. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come. These Roman Christians would have heard that differently. Christian, something new has come. A new heir. A new king. Greater than that of Caesar Augustus. Greater than the Roman Empire. Something new has come. Something new for mankind. Then we get to the name Jesus. In the beginning, the gospel, Jesus. The gospel here is in one name. The name Jesus, we find out from, Mar from Matthew one twenty one. the angel comes to Joseph and says, you will name him Jesus. Why? Why Jesus? Well, the angel says, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, the Hebrew Yeshua, linked to the name Joshua. Joshua led the Israelites out of the um, uh, wilderness, across the Jordan, into the promised land. He was their Savior, and now here is the greater Savior, the greater Joshua, Jesus, who is now bringing his people out of their sins, into the new heavens and the new earth. Many times people think the name Christ is Jesus' last name. you got Mary and Joseph Christ and James Christ and then Jesus. That's not a last name. Christ is a title. Emperor, King, Boss, Mr., Mrs., Reverend, General. It's a title. Christ... Um, Christos means to anoint, the anointed one. In the Old Testament, kings, prophets, and priests were all anointed with oil and set apart for a special task. Kings to rule, priests to mediate between God and people, prophets to declare the word of God. And now here is Jesus Christ who takes up the mantle of prophet, priest, and king. He is our prophet who bears the word of God to us. He is our king who rules over us as a great king. And he is our priest who stands before us. He is the anointed. He is the anointed one, Jesus Christ. And then if you look down a few verses where it says, prepare the way of the Lord. I'm just adding this in. The word Lord. That is 
the Hebrew name, the covenant name for God, Yahweh. Mark is calling Jesus Yahweh. He is God. Kyrios is the name for God. The eternal God has become man and has drawn near to us. We're familiar at Christmas time with the word Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Jesus, the Son of God, God is now with us. All of that gospel, all of those meanings packed into one sentence that the early church would have completely gotten. Point two. Now let's look at the herald of the gospel. And not herald, the guy that you know from TV, or the, but a, a herald, one who comes before a king and announces something. If you were all comic book fans, I would use a different analogy, but it will fall on everybody but two, so we won't do that. Heralds were common for kings. These heralds would go before the king, preparing his way, proclaiming his name, his achievements, and the expectations for the hearers. And Mark begins no different. A new world has come. A new man has come to us. And here is his herald. Look at what it says. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That is his proclamation. Now, let's learn a little bit about this herald. Verse 4 tells us a bit about him. John appeared, baptizing, that's a verb, in the wilderness and proclaiming, another verb, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John is a herald who is proclaiming a message. And his message coincides with his person. This is not part of my sermon, but I just want to make note of this. Did any of you catch what the guy is wearing? I don't think camel hair comes in fashion too often, right? I imagine it was very itchy and not like, a, you know, fine fur. I'm sure it was. And then a leather belt, which that's kind of normal, I guess. And did you catch his diet? Locusts, which when you dive into the etymology of that, it's probably locusts and grasshopper and those types of things. Doesn't that just whet your appetite? Luke, hurry up, finish the sermon, because I'm now hungry talking about eating locusts and wild honey. This was a wild man, but he's a humble man. John stands in contrast to the upper-class religious temple people. John stands in humility. John is humble. John is different, and he is proclaiming a different message. This herald was promised right there in verse 2, as it was written in Isaiah the prophet 600 years before today. Our country's not even that old. 600 years ago, John was uh, promised, Mark is telling us. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, Mark is right. Most of this comes from Isaiah. But over the centuries, rabbis had put together a collection of verses. We'll call it a tapestry. A herald tapestry, so to speak, of verses from different places in the Old Testament that promised a forerunner, a herald, someone who would come first before the Messiah. And we see all three of these in this little verses 2 and 3. For example, in Exodus 23, 20, listen to this. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way, to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. The rabbi saw this verse talking about the one who will come before the Messiah. You have in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger. Now, angel means messenger. Okay, Here it says, Behold, I send not my angel, but my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. 
and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Another part of the tapestry of the forerunner. And finally, what Lindy read for us a moment ago, Isaiah chapter 40, 3 and 5, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every uh, mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Why am I reading all of these verses? Luke, you're losing your audience because it's important for you to understand. The gospel was not plan B. The gospel was not God looking down upon earth and saying, man, they have made a mess of this. i got to come up with a plan to save these people. I got it. Jesus, we're going to put you in at the ninth inning. That's, that's not how it happened. Jesus was always planned. Jesus was always planned, plan A. The cross was always the purpose. Before the foundations of the world, Christ was going to be crucified on the cross. John the Baptist was going to be born. And Mark wants these Roman Christians to understand this herald, not even talking about the Messiah, but the herald, was promised six, eight, even several thousand years before he came about. This is no accident. What encouraging words that must have been to know that while they are suffering, while they are in a situation of unknown, will they find us? Will they catch us? Will my faith get me killed? They have the certainty knowing the God that I am worshiping is the one who is ultimately in control of all things. What was the herald's message? First, it was about repentance. John was not calling Israel to say, I'm so sorry. You ever heard someone repent to you and they said, I'm sorry. And you could tell, oh, I don't think you're really sorry. You're just telling me you're sorry, but you ain't really sorry. You're sorry you got caught. I'm sorry. That's not what John is calling these people to. I'll try harder. Nope. Or, we're all sinners. We all mess up. That's not what John is calling these people to. John was calling them to radical repentance. Deep heartfelt grieving over sin and turning into the opposite direction, forsaking these actions and adopting new actions, letting go this behavior and taking on a new behavior. I love how the Westminster Shorter Catechism puts it. It asks, what is repentance? Here's what the old Westminster divines wrote. Repentance unto life. It's a saving grace. It's something given to you by God. Whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of their sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of endeavor after new obedience. How many of you say that you're sorry for committing a sin, but still keep the avenue to sin together. Let me put it this way. Maybe you have a bad habit of gossiping. It's a bad sin. You hate it. And it seems that that sin comes out the most when Betty Lou or Bob Jones is around. And you know that every time Betty Lou and Bob Jones comes around, you're going to just bump your gums and tell, all kind of secrets, and you repent, but you don't get rid of Betty Lou or rebuke Betty Lou or change your relationship. You kind of keep her close by because while you want to have forgiveness, you still want that relationship to gossip with Bob Jones. And Does that make sense? That's not repentance. Repentance is not still keeping an opportunity to sin. Repentance is getting rid, burning the bridges, getting rid of the people, getting rid of the things that could lead you back into that sin and with all purpose going into a new, into a new direction. Not perfectly, but with full purpose and intent. And friends, even now, whether you are a Christian or not, God is calling you this morning to repent 
over sin. Now, for the Christian, your repentance looks different. Much like in a marriage, husbands, wives, you've gotten into a fight with your spouse. Did that immediately? Oh, we're in a fight. Now we're not married anymore. No, of course you're still married. Of course the relationship's still there. You're just not talking to each other. I haven't talked to my wife in 30 years. No, all right. It, it can get to that point. The relationship is still intact. The fellowship is broken. Repentance restores the communication. When Christians sin against God, we are still his sons and daughters. Repentance reconnects the fellowship and communication. Christians, some of you this morning need to repent before we take communion. Maybe you're not a Christian this morning. You're outside the faith. You still need to repent. But your repentance is to create the relationship with the Father. Repenting of your sin, I am sorry, I have tried to live life my own way, do things as I saw fit best, and I repent of my sins and I submit my life to you. There is a difference, but we all need to repent this morning with an aim to burn bridges that allow us to walk back into sin. Not only that, John's message was of repentance and of faith and trust. Sometimes we can hear the words gospel, faith, and trust, and it turns into the Charlie Brown show, womp, 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 womp. Or Christian, have you ever caught yourself using Christian language and stopped for a moment and said, what in the world does that mean? Well, you just got to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, I've heard that a million times, but stop. Translate into another language. What does that actually mean? John is calling people to put faith in the one that is coming after him. What does that look like? Well, let me give you two examples. You look in verse 7. And, he's, and he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Let's, let's, let's pause there. What is John saying? We might lose the interpretation there. Do you know what the nastiest part of a person was back in that day? You didn't have sneakers. You didn't have boots. Maybe you didn't have sandals because you didn't have enough money. I would not have survived. I have to wear shoes all the time. I, I hate taking my shoes off. Those of you who've had me at your house, you know... I don't like to take my shoes off. Well, in that time and place, either you went barefoot or maybe you had some sandals. So can you imagine walking miles in all kinds of different directions in a dusty area where sewage does not get tunneled underground? Where there is no underground getting rid of just rainwater. And you come to somebody's house. Pretty gross, isn't it? And so you would have a servant that you've paid. And this servant was the lowest of the lowest of the lowest of the servants. And it would be this servant that whenever guests came to your house, they would stoop down, they would take sandals off, and they would wash these nasty feet. And here John, who is now preaching to multitudes. One commentary I read said he was preaching to 300,000 people. He is a celebrity. They're coming to him in droves. And he says, I am so low and so worthless. I don't even have the enough clout to untie his shoes. I am not even high enough as the lowest servant to untie the Messiah's sandals. That's trust. To humble yourself and to put your expectations and respect and hope in. To put yourself second and someone else first. That is a trust. When, when Jesus is already baptized and he starts his ministry, John's disciples come and say, hey, the people that were following us are now following, Je or, yeah, following Jesus. And John says, good, he must increase and I must decrease. 
John was always about make Jesus bigger and make John smaller. Let me give you another example. Have any of you seen a child who is standing on a tall ledge and they're looking over at their father or mother? The arms are lifted up and the parent says, jump to me, jump. And the child has a little bit of apprehension, nervousness. It's a long way down. And finally, the child jumps into the arms of mom and dad. That is trust. Full faith, full believing mom and dad will catch. John is telling the people, turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your works of righteousness. You trying to prove to God you're good enough. Turn from those things and put your trust in Jesus Christ. John has put his whole life, health, and livelihood completely in Jesus Christ. Christian, are you trusting in Jesus Christ in this moment? Are you putting your faith in your money? I was talking to a friend yesterday, and we were laughing. Some rich guy, I don't know his name. He said, if you're rich and you have a problem, and you have enough money to fix the problem, you don't have a problem. Right? If you got enough money to fix the problem, is there a problem? That's the problem. Sometimes we depend upon money, resources, clout, friends, health, and we're not trusting in Jesus, we're trusting in these things. Christian, this morning, are you trusting in Christ or are you trusting in something else? Friend, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, what are you trusting in? Everybody trusts in something. Your experiences, your parents, your deeds, Nothing but Jesus Christ can save you from your sins. Point three, something that has baffled a lot of people. Let's look at the Messiah, his baptism. We hear the word baptism all the time. It's nothing new. Presbyterians and Baptists like to debate, is it sprinkling and pouring or is it dunking? If you don't dunk everybody, do you have to re-dunk? I mean, it's a fun, fun conversation to have over coffee with with uh, people that you love, not with people you don't like, because it turns into a bad argument. We, we, we get baptism. But during this day and time, this idea of baptism was totally new and novel. While there were some baptisms for converts coming into Ju Judaism, Jews were never called to be baptized. And while the religious elites were calling sinners just to do better, John is calling them to be baptized and to repent. I don't care if you're a child of Abraham. I don't care if you are from the tribe of Judah. You need to come, repent, and be baptized. But John's message was also telescoped upon a single theme proclaiming that there is a person coming after him who will not baptize with water. His baptism will be more powerful. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John could baptize with water and cleanse the outward person, but the eternal act could not change the heart. But Jesus is coming, who will be able to baptize you with the power of the Holy Spirit. He is able to change the sinner and make them righteous. This morning, you can be reborn. You could be forgiven and be made new. And a little caveat before we start talking about baptism and moving into the Lord's Supper. A little application we can take real quick. None of you are John the Baptist. None of us are called to John the Baptist's specific ministry. But we all are very similar. We are Jesus' heralds. That Jesus is coming back again. And we are to stand in contrast to the world around us in our clothing, in our words, in our values, where we spend our time, where we spend our money. Our stuff should be consistent with our beliefs and our words. Our message to our neighbor, friends, family, and strangers of sin, repentance, and trust in Jesus Christ should be consistent with our living, as it was with John the Baptist. Now, here's the question I want to ask. Why was Jesus baptized? 
You ever thought about that? Remember, what was John's baptism for? Repentance. If Jesus was perfect, never sinned, why did he need to be baptized? He had to be baptized because of you and me. Jesus was our representative. Jesus identified himself with sinners, lived among sinners, loved sinners, was baptized on behalf of sinners, lived a true repentant life, and he died as the representative of sinners. Jesus goes into the waters for you and for me. And when he comes out, the Father says, This is my beloved Son. All that John the Baptist had promised, his whole message and his being, were being confirmed. The Father says, This is my Son. And I am pleased with Him. And the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus Christ. This man is going to change everything. This man can change you. I don't know if the people on the banks saw and heard the Father and the Spirit. But this morning as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper, this is an invisible thing made visible. We can't go back and see Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. But we've been given a picture. The bread in your cup is a picture of Jesus Christ's perfect, unblemished body that was broken for you. Your representative, it should have been your body, but it was His. The juice in the cup represents His blood that was spilled for you. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It should have been your blood. But instead, it was Christ's blood. And this morning, as we take, and it is just regular bread and regular grape juice, it symbolizes and points to a spiritual reality of what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. And so as we take the meal, we put our full faith in Jesus Christ that He has actually died on the cross for us. He actually was baptized on behalf of us. He died on the cross on behalf of us. And He has now risen from the dead. And if we trust and repent of our sins, on the final day we will rise again too. That's what the gospel is all about. That sinners can be forgiven. If you would look now to your bulletin as we walk into our time of communion. After hearing the gospel preached to you, I'm going to ask you, and I want you to respond affirming your faith, if indeed you do believe this. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you read out loud with me this corporate confession of sin, a time for us as a body of believers to confess to the Lord our sins and transgressions. Holy God, You created us in Your likeness, but through original sin, the image of God was utterly defaced in man, and we became by nature hostile to God, slaves to Satan, and servants to sin. And thus everlasting death has had and shall have power and dominion over all who have not been. 
are not or shall not be born from above. This rebirth is brought by the power of the Holy Ghost, creating in the hearts of God's chosen ones as assured faith in the promise of God, revealed to us in His Word. By this faith we grasp Christ Jesus with the graces and blessings promised in Him. Amen. Would you take a moment now on your own, repenting of your individual and personal sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Now hear a word of the gospel. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice forever. That is what you have, Christian. As we get ready to take the Lord's Supper now, let me give a few words of caution. This meal is a special meal. And it is for all of God's people, whether you are a member of our church or not. If you are a member of God's family, having put faith in Jesus Christ, repented of sin. If you can read the Apostles' Creed and amen everything, welcome. We want you to take the meal with us this morning. This morning, if you're not a Christian, you know that you're not a Christian, please don't take the meal. It is for God's family. If you drink and take of this meal without being in God's family, you bring judgment upon yourself. And I would call you to repent and put faith in Jesus Christ before you take the meal. Parents, if your child has not put faith in Jesus Christ, let them observe and watch you take the meal. Let them ask questions and teach them today. But if they've not put faith in Jesus Christ, this meal still is not yet for them, though we pray it will be someday. And then finally, Christian, if there is sin in your heart right now that you can't let go, you prayed the corporate and you prayed the individual, and there's just, you can't let it go, don't take the meal. Until you can forgive as you have been forgiven, you will only drink judgment upon your heart if you take this meal. Let me read to you the words of the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, as you have called us to regularly observe the Lord's Supper, it is a visual picture of what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. I pray that we will take this meal by faith, trusting in what Christ has done, what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life, and that you will encourage us, build faith, build dependence, build repentance, devotion, and discipleship toward you. In Jesus' name, amen. Be very careful as you open the top. There's that top pink layer. Go ahead and open that. So the wafer comes out. This wafer represents the body of Jesus Christ. This body has been broken for you. Take and eat. Now, open the lid to the juice. As you heard the scripture say after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. 
spilled for you. Take and drink. Let us pray. Father, we rejoice as your people who have been born again, made new, who have been raised up, lifted up, and seated with your Son, Jesus Christ, in the realms above. As we live here on earth, help us to live holy lives filled with uh, a sweet aroma of worship that would um, honor you, fill you with glory. Help us to live a life that would show that love and honor to our neighbor. Help us to be messengers of the gospel, to share the good news, as Mark did, to those who are around us in this community. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Would you stand with me and sing our doxology as we get ready to close? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Before I give the benediction, be in prayer for the session we meet on Tuesday that God would give us wisdom as we lead this church forward. Remember that the last Sunday of the month, we are going to remember, recognize Gracie and her accomplishments. And parents of kids who want to go to church camp, come see me after service. I have forms that we need to fill out today. Now receive a word from the Lord. May the Lord who longs to be gracious to you, who waits on high to have compassion on you, plant you firmly in the, in the faith, established steadfast and unmovable through the hope of the gospel proclaimed to all the creation under heaven. Amen.